It's a very special time and place. As you've heard of some of the pr preparations which have been made for this, and of how web science involves people from all disciplines coming together from different sides. We've talked about it for a long time, but this is the first web science conference. This is where, if you like, web science is now being born. We've watched its gestation in some workshops, but this, here we are at what is hopefully the birth of a new field. We're in a very special play, uh, place, as Wendy mentioned, where, which has been a birth, has seen the birth of a lot of thinking back through the ages. So, it's a time to celebrate, but it's a time to, and it's a time to celebrate and it's a time to look forward. But I'm going to start now from this vantage point, looking back looking back, answering some of the questions that people ask me in the hallway. One of them is, okay, so what made you do it in the first place? In fact, it's a good question, but in fact, it, it was going back almost exactly 20 years. I wrote the first memo about the web, and what really led to it was frustration. I was working at a wonderful place, uh, CERN, the European Particle Physics Lab in Geneva. People there come from also from all over. They were almost all physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, but engineers. They come from all over the world to make these huge machines. And they put together different pieces, and they should, when they hopefully when they put them together, they'll fit together and do some and they'll do high energy physics. But to make them all fit together, they have to understand each other's pieces. And of course, they come with different computer systems. They all come from different universities. They bring different documentation systems. They're different, different, different word processes. And so back 20 years ago, 1989, my frustration as a software engineer was that it was difficult, very difficult, to be able to find all the information I needed to do my job. I had to log on to one computer here and learn one programming, one programming language. I had to learn here, I had to log on to a different computer and learn a documentation system. And here I had to log on to a different computer, maybe using a different network, and learn how to get in touch with the library system. And when I got into some, some, some information, maybe I could get it back, but often if I got it back, it was in a format that I couldn't use it, couldn't directly use it on my computer. So, it was an obvious frustration. If you're a software engineer, then you know that these frustrations are a challenge to your imagination. If you can imagine things being better, then you ought to go and write the program. So, uh, the idea was that life could be better. There could be one imaginary information system which we may, what one made to include all these others, to include them with references between them with links that you could click on. It's a really simple idea. And I wrote it up in a memo. Uh, I wrote it in a memo because CERN is a physics lab. It's not really set up to do software. So there wasn't anywhere you could apply to do some software. And in fact, it has to, very, it has to stop people writing software because all these creative people, if you let them write all the software they wanted, they'd be spending no time doing anything else because it's such, so much fun solving these problems. By, by, by uh, writing new software, making up programs. So I passed around the memo, and uh, a year later, nothing really had happened. Uh, somebody asked me, oh, what about that idea, that, that hypertext, that information system? I said, well, I sent you a memo. And they said, oh, did you? Oh, could you send it again? So I sent it around, and I put the date, March 1989, which was the first time, comma, May 1990, which was the second time, just to rub it in, make it obvious, sent it around and again nothing happened. But then one of these special things happened. My boss, Mike, Mike Sendall, allowed me to buy a fancy new computer system. Those, uh, those black boxes called Next, which Steve Jobs was producing at that time, were the latest thing in computing. And the latest thing particularly in systems which you could write new pro which were good for writing new programs. They had a great development environment. 
So the plan was to buy one of these nets and see how good it was. And so by doing that, uh, and in order to see how good it was, I should design some program on it, some random program. How about that hypertext thing you were talking about? So he didn't really give me the nod, but he gave me the wink. He said, go ahead. And that was, uh, that was what allowed me to actually write the software, make a web browser, make a web editor. So at the time, I had to uh, sacrifice a few things. Most systems people expected to be completely inconsistent but I realized that in order to make, have a system which would grow, we'd occasionally have to have links which didn't go anywhere. And you'll find that when you we, web, use the web now, sometimes there'll be a link goes somewhere that's gone away. And, but that was, in fact, a really important engineering decision because to make the whole web consistent would have been unscalable. It wouldn't have worked. It would have stopped the web growing. So that was, uh, some, that was the technology. That was, if you like, the invention. But what was more exciting for me than the technology itself was the way that took off as a community. There was a community of people, random people, in different fields, different countries. Somebody would hear about it. I'd give a talk, not to an audience of this size, but smaller one, but maybe three people at the back might, get an, might be sufficiently excited to go away and do something. And they would send me an email. I'd get an email from one of them saying, oh, I'm running a web server now. I've put some photos on it. It's an exhibition of Vatican Renaissance art. It's a dinosaur exhibit. It's all kinds of things. And they sent me a list. They sent me the, the a URL, the thing with HTTP, uh, which tells you the name of a web server. And I kept a list of all the web servers. And I have a copy of that list from November 1991, when it had 26 web servers on it. That time, uh, I had the whole, a copy of my whole website on a floppy disk, which I could take to conferences. So that community of people growing faster and faster was what made it take off. And it's the creativity and also the public spiritedness of people out there just thinking, well, I know the web hasn't taken off yet, but if everybody started a web server, it would be great. So I will do it. There are some people who if, when it would be great if everybody did X, they will do X, just for the sake of it. P those people did it, and it took off. And the first web, that first web server, which was still that, that black box on my desk for a long time, when we looked at the number of people who viewed it, each month, the number of people who looked at that web server was 10 times the number of people for the same month a year before. So the, the interest in the web server, that one web server, was going up by a factor of 10 every year. An exponential growth, a very steady exponential growth. So at first it was geeks who were excited, and then it was, uh, it was the, the Economist, I think was the first newspaper, then other newspapers, then the tabloid press, and then uh, even ministers and heads of state started to become aware of this as, it, as the news spread. And we realized that we needed to coordinate this growth. 